Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to our Connecting the Dots webinar today. Thanks so much for joining. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started and introduce our speaker today. Uh, right now, everyone is on mute, and we'll keep it that way just for the sake of everyone being able to hear our speaker. You'll see in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, there's a Q&A box. Feel free at any time to send a question there. Uh, I will be monitoring those, and we will either make sure that your questions get asked as they are, you know, as Sergi is speaking, or we'll wait uh, to the end, whichever is more relevant. But please don't hesitate to uh, type your questions there. We'll be sure to get to them. Um, for everyone who is joining the call today uh, and remains with us throughout, we will be sending you a certificate for a professional development credit, so we hope that is helpful. Um, and without any further ado, I will introduce our speaker today. He has a bit of an unorthodox bio that he would like us to read, um, so I'll go ahead and share that with you before he begins. Sergi has a wife, four kids, one very ugly dog, and one dog that does not listen at all. No cats, and his goal in life is to become one of the globe's richest 1%, which own half of the world's wealth. He plans to become famous by conducting webinars like today, and if that doesn't work out, he'll go back to working for the state government, like many of today's participants, in order to achieve his goal. So without any further ado, here is Mr. Sergi Amerkanian. Thank you so much, Amy. Good afternoon or good morning for some of you people. My name is Sergi Amerikanian. I'm, uh, as Amy mentioned, uh, happily married with four kids with many problems like the rest of you guys. So uh, today I was asked to talk about the effects of uh, liquid anti-strip additives. It's something that is uh, dear to my heart. I did my uh, PhD work in this area. 35 years ago, way before Amy was born. And uh, I've been working in this area of asphalt for many years. I was with Clemson University for many, many years, 25 years now. I'm with the University of Alabama and go around the world, talk about asphalt, and bore people to death. Fortunately, you guys are the victims today. So I will start the presentation by, oh, Amy asked me, just because people, uh, that don't know each other. She asked me to at least show uh, a picture of mine uh, that it goes with my bio. And I remember a famous saying that uh, the older you become, uh, your dogs or you look more like your dogs. So I thought, well, if that's the case, this is the way I look my younger days. This is the way I look now. However, as you know, the angle of the camera makes a big difference. So this is the way I look most of the day. So, um, and the goal today was to introduce you a little bit, a little bit uh, basic information about anti-strip additives in general, how it works, how it's going to affect the payments, and hopefully we'll learn from each other by asking some questions and so forth. So, and uh, I know. Uh, this bulb doesn't do much for some of you guys, so I decided just to show you what you are familiar with. I know, I know, as my kids pointed at me, there are many other uh, devices around. So here we go. Uh, the outline is going to be something like this. Not necessarily in that order. I never follow uh, my own outline, so, but we'll try to get to the most of this topics. As an introduction, as you know, many states, including probably your own, if you work for a state agency, they require anti-strip additives in many of the mixtures in order to make the payment performance a little bit better. And many state agencies, including where I am, which I live still in South Carolina, Clemson, so I'm on Eastern time right now. Many DOTs have an approved qualified list for many of the products used within each state. And in many cases, either is hydrated lime or liquid anti-strip additive. And uh, liquid anti-strip additives, in general, they work by reducing the surface tension, the interface between the aggregate and the asphalt binder. That is the key for success. 
just as uh, uh, make sure it's very clear, I'm not here to talk about uh, any specific products, uh, and I'm not getting paid for this. Uh, hint, hint, Amy, uh, just if you want to think about it. And I'm not promoting any products by any means, and I'm not going to bad math one versus the other one. But if you have any questions, one versus the other, I'll be glad to tell you my views. So as an introduction, there are many factors that is going to affect uh, the properties of the payment, especially when we talk about uh, moisture damage in payments, because that is, to me, in my views, enemy number one. And I've looked at payments all over the world, from Southeast Asia to Europe to Russia to you name it, Canada, U.S., many states. And really, if we take care of water, uh, we are going to do wonders for our society. And usually that moisture damage is going to be affected by many of the properties that the aggregate has, what type you are using, binder type, binder grade, depending upon if it's polymer or not. The gradation of the aggregate makes it this way. Aggregate type is important, but the gradation also is very important. Air voids, do you have 4% or 9 or 10? Uh, traffic level, and obviously environmental issues, uh, some states that I'm sure some of you are from, uh, free star cycles and so forth, it's a major issue. And most importantly, if you are using any additives or not. Uh, and if you are using them, and if you really look at it, uh, you will see a major difference between uh, with the products that you are not using versus the ones that you are using. And the most important one to me is the last line, which is drainage, drainage, drainage. You take care of those guys, uh, you'll be in a good shape in most cases. I thought before we go any further, I'll just give you a brief introduction of the way I look at asphalt. So uh, at, at least we know, because we talk about uh, stripping has something to do with the interface of asphalt or binder, bitumen, however you want to say it, AC, when I started 35 plus years ago, and the aggregate. Uh, that bitumen or the asphalt of the binder, I call it black gold, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depending upon who you talk to, uh, is, uh, it's a byproduct of refinery process. So we get our jet fuels, we get our chemicals, we get everything else, diesel, suddenly what's left, uh, which is gooey mess, we call it the asphalt, and, and it's a byproduct. So the shells and exons of this world, they really don't have much control over uh, what they get at the end. And, 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 and the chemistry of asphalt is very complex. Uh, I'm not going to bore you more than I am right now with the chemistry of asphalt, uh, but uh, it, depending upon the process and where it's coming from and the source of asphalt, is it from Venezuela, Russia, Canada, uh, California, and so forth, Mexico, it will make a big difference what type of asphalt you are coming up, the molecular size, uh, the large molecular size versus small ones, medium, and so forth will make a big difference, and that's going to be affecting the performance of your uh, payment. As you know, payments are nothing new. It's been around forever, and we just started 120 plus years ago or so to really calling it uh, paving actually, you know, in the field. And it was done fairly similar than what we are doing today. Not much has changed, and instead of horses now we use trucks and so forth, but overall it's pretty much the same. And the ultimate goal is to get something like this, or something like this, uh, something like this, but if your life is like mine, sometimes you end up with stuff like this, which is sometimes I call it a reality. And, and it's something that we are all facing it, has nothing to do with my state versus yours, it's all over. And, and this is something that uh, we'll be discussing today for half an hour or so. Uh, how do we minimize, minimize, not eliminate completely, but minimize some of these issues? And some of the problems are, uh, it's about the asphalt, the interaction of asphalt and the aggregate, which goes from uh, base, sub-base, all the way to the surface. And in all of these areas, uh, it can be affected by water. If the water gets in, it's going to create many of the headaches you are facing 
on a daily basis. And the chemistry of asphalt is going to help you or hurt you. So very briefly about the chemistry of asphalt. Asphalt in general is a complex uh, mixture of hydrocarbons, over 90%, with different size and polarity. And, uh, and there are some other things, 10 plus percent or so, sulfur, oxygen, nitrogen, and some metals. And the chemical composition, as we discussed before, it really varies from source to source. Uh, and that's some of the problems that we are facing. And by the way, many people ignore that fact, either knowingly or unknowingly. And it's a composite of material of consisting different ranges from nano to macro scales. That, uh, I'll show you a slide, a uh, couple of slides from now. And uh, the asphalt itself, or the bitumen, has several uh, components. Uh, two of them are asphaltins and resins uh, that uh, provide the adhesive properties of the asphalt. We'll come back to that terminology later on, because that's what the anti-strip additives, liquid ones, are providing a better bond between the surface of aggregate and the binder itself. And just to look at what do I mean by nano and macro, this is what it looks like uh, at the nano level. You got obviously asphaltines and maltines that they are doing their job there. At the m m micro level, you are having a mastic, which is some fillers in it. And, and then it gets a little bit more complicated when you start adding the uh, aggregates, either smaller size aggregates or larger size aggregates uh, at the macro scale. And, and, and all these are going to point by point affecting the performance of your payments. And make the matter worse, if you do a chemical analysis of your asphalt, uh, you will see major differences from source to source. And this is a slide of showing you the different uh, components of various asphalt sources that people have looked at it for many years. Uh, I've looked at uh, asphalt, actually, the chemistry of asphalt since 85, or, uh, I'm sorry, 83 or so, and it's amazing the differences you see from source to source and uh, from even within the same source, month to month, sometimes you see the differences. So all that's going to affect it. This is an example, uh, and uh, the structure of two bitumens, uh, same grade, by the way, uh, 64 minus uh, 22 type thing, it could be completely different. Uh, the left-hand side is a different asphalt source, uh, right-hand side different asphalt, and you can see the differences chemically. And that's going to affect the performance uh, in the field. And the same thing for other uh, components of the mixture, because your asphalt has uh, several components, and two of the major ones are your asphaltines and resins that are going to affect the performance. And at the meantime, we are making life a little bit more complicated by adding many, many polymers to make this thing better. Either it's PE, PP, you name it. SDS, which is probably king of the hill, uh, or uh, scrap tires that have been doing it, have been involved for many, many years. Uh, paving industry is uh, growing like crazy on a daily basis, so this issue is not going to go away and we are spending a lot of money, and we are using many, many tonnage on a daily basis. And majority of this bitumen market, global market, is in paving area, 85%. So it's an issue that we need to worry about when we talk about the performance of our payments. And there are many distresses uh, that we are uh, facing on a daily basis, from rutting to fatigue cracking to many other issues. And uh, number one key is uh, moisture damage. If uh, you take care of your water, uh, you are going to really do wonders. One way to do it, to minimize the damage, is the, uh, the use of additives. Additives could be at many shapes, size, forms, different percentages, and so forth. So there are many test procedures, many DOTs use, as you know, as you are very familiar. And uh, from boiling water tests all the way to modified lotment. 
And in my view, again, there are some research has been done. Uh, all of these are somewhat effective. I don't know if we have the most effective testing as of today uh, to really determine uh, what works, what doesn't work. But most of these, and I've used all of them uh, in different shapes, sizes, forms, and uh, it works somewhat effectively. And I put them in somewhat an order. Uh, that boiling water test probably is used the least in different states, and modified Lotman and tonic leaf and root probably are number one or two. So, and moisture damage, there are uh, different contributing factors, from detachment all, uh, all the way to pore pressure induced damage, uh, to uh, uh, the effects of environment on the aggregate asphalt system. And that is the interface between aggregate and asphalt, which is extremely important. If you don't take care of that interface and make it a little bit stronger, it's going to really uh, give you a lot of headaches in the future. Very briefly, what is stripping, as we discussed before, is basically separation of your asphalt binder from aggregate source. And that leads to stripping in asphalt payments, and ultimately it causes uh, what you see in these pictures, and I'm sure you have many of your own, unfortunately. And it could be, by the way, uh, from either top or bottom of an asphalt payment layer, because the water goes in, stays at the bottom, uh, the pressure, pore pressure, it can uh, create uh, issues for you. So it's not all, always from top to bottom. It could be starting from uh, bottom. In all cases, regardless of how it starts, uh, the water is uh, the key here. And uh, that bond, uh, when it uh, deteriorates, uh, you are asking for trouble. And therefore, the babbling starts puddle, rutting, and so forth. One of the few things that I know of you can do, unless you cover the payment and not make sure the water does not get into it, is uh, use of additives. And if you do that, uh, that will significantly affect uh, the life of the payment, therefore saving a lot of resources and funding and so forth. So, now, a brief introduction of uh, liquid anti-strip additives. Basically, uh, we add, as you know, the additives to the asphalt to increase the bond of asphalt aggregate uh, interface and add to the strength of that adhesion of uh, those two uh, components. And, and that uh, chemical bond, uh, it's extremely important. That's what it makes it uh, a good system. And, and, and this is extremely important to understand why it happens, because uh, uh, we think any time water shows up, uh, there's a problem, which is true, but you can at least minimize uh, the level of the problem and, and decrease the headaches that you are going to have in the future. Uh, and the way that it happens, the acid groups of the asphalt binder at the interface of your aggregate and asphalt when the water shows up, a reaction happens that it uh, produces a negative charge. So you have a negative charge on the asphalt now. If you have a negative charge on uh, aggregate, and that causes, uh, I call it the bad date. Uh, nothing is happening. Uh, it's going to go away. And when you move away from the situation, and that's what we call stripping, right? The, this bonding of uh, asphalt from the aggregate surface. And that's where the, most of the problems are uh, happening. And you can minimize that by maybe using a different aggregate source that is not strip prone. And uh, you need to be careful. And sometimes you don't have any choice, obviously. Every state has its own issues. And if you are, um, you got more silica, you got more problems. And I just put some listing together, uh, uh, stripping potential from uh, granite on top that you will see probably more stripping in those areas all the way to limestone and marble and so forth at the bottom that might produce less stripping. And that's a general comment because 
many uh, research sometimes has shown uh, uh, it doesn't happen every single time. That's why. Uh, moisture damage, uh, we had this issue since day one. Nothing has changed really. And uh, the first research reports I've seen, uh, early 1930s, about moisture damage. And uh, one of the solutions uh, came up with years ago, uh, anti-strip additives. Hydrated lime was used first extensively. Liquid anti-strip additives came to the market soon after. Uh, however, initially there were some issues with liquid anti-strip additives. They were not uh, so much heat resistant. And uh, today it's a little bit different, obviously. Uh, and I've been looking at this for 35 years, uh, liquid and versus lime and versus many other uh, products. And it has changed tremendously, the liquid anti-strip additives, the effectiveness. But at the end of the day, uh, as, as long as you take care of your payments, the moisture does not get in. And if you have liquid anti-strip additives or any other additives added to your mixture, you are going to have a successful uh, program. The problem is you need to take care of three things. Drainage, drainage, and you got it, uh, drainage. If you take care of those three things, you are not going to have many issues. But easier said than done. Uh, how is it looking right now? Uh, it depends where you are. In South Carolina, we did a major, major research project, 83. The report was done 87. It was a four-year project. And we found that the 10 percent of all of our payments, we had uh, 1,500 field cores. And yes, I got every one of them. Uh, it was uh, two or three summers. I'll never forget. It was torture. And with 90% 90, 90 humidity and 95 degrees. So we were there getting cores. 1,500 cores, we cut them into layers, three layers each, 4,500 set of uh, uh, samples basically we tested. And we found that 10% of the entire state mixtures had stripping issues. Other people have done um, uh, many, many years of research. And as of uh, 15 years ago or so, Indiana reported 10% uh, of their payments are uh, prone to moisture damage. Kansas, Minnesota, Tennessee, uh, almost without exception, uh, all states. If you really look at uh, look carefully, you will find stripping somewhere. So now, liquid anti-strip additives. Uh, they're in form of cationic surface active agents, and they have been used for many many years. Uh, in 1964, there were several research projects that done looking at this uh, concept. And at that time, though, uh, heat stable agents were not available. So some of the results were not uh, as good as they are uh, these days. And also, there were some issues of determining the quantity of additives used. And all of these issues at this point have been resolved in many, many cases. People are using it around the country with great success. Uh, cost, which is extremely important. Is it cost effective? It really depends uh, how you look at it and how do you consider cost as part of your everyday life. Uh, the average life, for example, in Pennsylvania, and this is uh, several years ago, Pennsylvania did a major uh, research in this area, and they determined the average life with good moisture resistant uh, aggregate is approximately 12 years. Uh, however, they found that uh, uh, for payments susceptible to moisture damage, it's only six years if no anti-strip additives used. So you cut it by half. And then they find out if uh, you use the right anti-strip additives to the aggregate that is strip prone, that life is increased to nine years. Now, again, you have to consider this is an estimate, so there are a lot of guesswork going on. But you see the difference. Now, as a taxpayer, putting my taxpayer hat on, uh, I would be yelling at DOT like they do, unfortunately, every day, people, without knowing what they are talking about in many cases. I, if I'm putting that hat on, I'm looking at these numbers, hey, it's not a bad day. If you use a little bit of money up front, use it and make it more effective, I'm going to gain probably around three years or so, if not more. 
And that's a lot, as you know, in, in our industry. Uh, I thought I'd show you a brief uh, research project. I, I've been, as I said, looking at this stuff forever, uh, different places around the country, around the world, so uh, asphalt in general, not just moisture damage. Uh, but uh, we just did a recently a project for South Carolina DOT and uh, uh, Federal Highway Administration. So I thought I'd briefly go over a research project, just show you some of the results and how uh, it might correspond to what uh, you are doing in your life. Uh, what we did, uh, we were going to evaluate the use of liquid. And uh, in South Carolina, just to give you a brief uh, background, uh, the DOT uh, allows a hydrated line in interstate system, or did, uh, in all of their mixtures. Hydrated line was king of the hill. So for many years, after uh, doing research, they decided to look at these liquid anti-strip additives, especially in high volume roads, uh, secondary roads, uh, I call it, that we use PG64-22 in many cases. And uh, DOT, uh, to give them credit, South Carolina, uh, to make life easy and make sure everybody, they came up with a dosage rate uh, uh, for uh, all admixtures, regardless of what the company was r recommending, uh, based on the weight of uh, binder. And uh, we decided to look at different dosage rates, uh, different anti-strip additives, and see how it will perform and compare it to lime, look at the moisture susceptibility of these mixtures. Obviously, literature review is part of it. And, and in many, many cases, uh, we found out that many people are saying the same thing that we have found out for many years, that both liquid anti-strip additives and hydrated lime can decrease the moisture sensitivity of an asphalt mixture, uh, which is true in many parts of the country. And liquid anti-strip additives uh, are effective in many of the cases and also uh, lime. Some cases, people reported that they use liquid anti-strip additives because it's easier, and at the end of the day, it will be uh, cheaper for them to use versus lime. In some cases, some people uh, recommended lime because they felt like it was more effective. So it's a lot depends upon where you are and so forth. For example, many states, with the exception of Georgia, such as Alabama, Florida, North Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, and so forth, they allow the use of liquid anti-strip additives in many of their mixtures. Uh, the work that I was involved with, I proposed to them, it was uh, six aggregate sources. You see five here, but the sixth one showed up later on for verification. And we use uh, the JMF that they are using every day. We did the percent wrap as they do every day. We added hydrated lime. We use uh, intermediate uh, A, which is for interstate system. It is, a is a type of mix surface, in this case, interme intermediate mix uh, that is used for interstate. B, uh, type course B, is uh, Mix B is used for secondary roads, high volume roads. And we did a gyratory mix design and we came up with optimum binder content and all the volume metrics. And then uh, what we did, uh, we used uh, again five, but it turned out to be six at the end, one for verification, see what we are getting if the model. Uh, fits the equation, and uh, we used uh, five different anti-strip additives, liquid, in different dosage rates. One that DOT recommends, and the other one uh, just a little bit different. And we used the same uh, intermediate A, intermediate B, surface B. And again, surface B is the uh, high volume roads in South Carolina. And we did ITS testing, board testing, uh, we did some AMPT also, and uh, that I don't uh, have it here. And, and we used different cores around the state, making sure we covered the entire state. These are the aggregate properties. We did uh, different uh, LA value all the way absorption. LA values range from 24, 25, all the way to 50 plus. 
and the percent absorption usually in South Carolina is less than one, so we don't have major issues. So, and uh, we use, as I said, five different uh, uh, liquid anti-strip additives, different uh, from different companies, different brands, and the dosage rate was 0.5 and 0.7, uh, with the exception of lime. That in South Carolina, for example, we use 1% by total weight of aggregate. In many parts of the country, uh, they go from uh, uh, up to 2% uh, in general uh, for line. The aggregate gradation uh, for all of the aggregate sources, six of them, look something like this, somewhat similar to each other, but there were some differences. And uh, some of the results, uh, effects of aggregate source on ITS value, for example, for surface B. This is for only one liquid, liquid ASA. And if you notice, uh, the aggregate source will make a difference of how the bar charts are going to behave. Uh, some are much, much higher compared to this one, compared to this one. So this is indicating the aggregate source in general is going to make a difference when you realize that uh, the gradation is very similar together. And the same asphalt is being used, and everything is the same, same operator, same testing. So this is indicating that the aggregate source is going to make a big difference. Then we did hydrated lime, obviously. And if you notice the uh, same thing you can say about hydrated lime, different aggregate source is going to uh, affect the results. And the results are fairly similar than what we were going, uh, what we were getting with liquid anti-strip additives. This is intermediate mixes, which is uh, used on interstate system. And as you notice again, aggregate source makes a big difference. And, uh, and, and one or two aggregate sources are much, much worse than the other ones. And that is true with either uh, lime or liquid anti-strip additives. And this is hydrated lime for the same thing, intermediate type A mixtures. So this is the effects of aggregates, indicating that the aggregate source, obviously, is going to make a difference. And uh, for surface type B mixtures, this is just aggregate A now. So we look at different anti-strip additives and different percentages. And this is a line here. And, and if you notice, they are all over, depending upon the different percentages or depending upon what type of anti-strip additives you use. And, and lime is fairly effective compared to other additives, but there are several liquid anti-strip additives that they are doing a little bit better than lime in this case. So that is for one again, one aggregate source, aggregate source A. And when you look at uh, aggregate source uh, E, for example, and, and a heavily traveled road, surface type B, uh, you can see some of the results. And this is line here, uh, third one from left. And uh, different percentages of dosage will make a big difference also. And that's something that you need to look at it and so forth. So. Uh, by the way, this ITS, uh, I, I apologize, I didn't say it. It stands for indirect tensile uh, strength uh, test. So I apologize. And the ASA, I call it anti-strip additive. So. Now, intermediate uh, type A mixtures, aggregate A, the uh, same type of story. Uh, uh, lime, fairly effective. Many of the liquid anti-strip additives as effective also. Aggregate E, which was one of the uh, strip-prone aggregates, uh, you can see the results are completely different because uh, even with lime, it's much, much lower values. And that was expected uh, as we knew beforehand uh, we went in. But some of the liquid anti-strip additives uh, were not as effective as, as I said, uh, line. So some of the results uh, we came up with, uh, uh, the surface type B mixtures, 
we feel like both dosage rates and ASA types are the major influence on the wet ITS values. The dry ITS values uh, I care, but not as much as wet ITS. That's my personal belief. Dry is important, but wet is more important. So I usually concentrate on wet, not just one value. And then we calculate uh, the TSR, which is the tensile strength ratio, which is the ratio of wet uh, on dry. And uh, that ratio, I always consider that ratio with wet ITS also. So I look at those two numbers together. And, and this is what I mean. This is the TSR tensile strength ratio, which is wet ITS over dry ITS times 100, 100%. And, and this is for liquid ASA uh, one, uh, one of the liquid and surface type B mixtures. And in South Carolina, we have a minimum requirement of TSR of 85%. And this is the results that we got uh, for this specific liquid and this specific aggregate sources. Now, uh, hydrated lime, uh, same uh, type of mixture, uh, same aggregates. These are the results. Uh, fairly effective of uh, coming up with minimum 85%. And uh, type A mixtures, intermediate. Uh, uh, I would consider this fairly a successful thing because uh, uh, we, we have some major issues with this aggregate source in the state anyway. And hydrated lime, fairly effective for the same aggregate source that the liquid was not doing it, but not as much major differences on other sources compared to liquid. So, so for the dosage rate on TSR, we feel like uh, in some cases, uh, the TSR increased slightly when the dosage rate was increased from 0.5 to 0.7. And we feel like it's a very complex issue that we are uh, dealing with. And the interaction of asphalt binder and aggregate is extremely important. And this nature of uh, this interaction is very difficult to predict with 100% accuracy or certainty because there are so many factors come into play, it's extremely difficult to you know, uh, uh, decide what caused it. Now, as a consultant, if you hire me, I'll tell you what caused it. But in reality, it's very difficult. I don't care who, who you talk to. It's very difficult to come up with the right answers in general. And there are many treatments to improve the moisture sensitivity. Uh, I feel like the hydrated lime and liquid anti-strip additives, both of them can improve the moisture sensitivity of HMA, but, but, but you have to do some testing beforehand to really figure it out, which is the most effective. In our case, for this research, specific research projects, the wet ITS values, they all pass the minimum requirement of 65 in many cases. 65 PSI requirement that South Carolina DOT has. And the aggregate source, and we knew this before we went in, it's uh, extremely uh, important, affecting the moisture susceptibility. And uh, surface type B mixtures uh, compared to intermediate A and B. Uh, there were some differences between those two indicating the effects of uh, aggregate gradation and size of the aggregates and that interaction between uh, uh, binder and aggregate is being affected. And we feel like the liquid ASA in many cases was uh, fairly effective. And we are recommending at this point uh, for DLT uh, there is not one research project is worth doing it if you don't come up with recommendations because you always need money. It's called job security. So as a researcher, now I'm putting my researcher hat, not as a taxpayer hat, on. And we are recommending to specif uh, South Carolina DOT consider specifying the use of liquid on all surface B mixtures as well as intermediate types A and B. 
However, they have to look at obviously the results of ITS and TSR values. We use tiny cliff and root in this state with some modifications, obviously. And uh, we recommend to study the use of polymers in the mixtures uh, and its effect on the performance of this uh, moisture susceptibility study. And also to look at the effects of chemical composition of aggregates on moisture susceptibility. And that becomes a little bit uh, uh, tricky uh, because let's face it, there are very few companies are going to be happy to hear that their aggregate source, uh, because they don't have much control over, is contributing to the uh, bad performance of the payment. Uh, I think I have bored you enough. I'd like to thank you for your time, and I'm hoping that hopefully working together, we can solve some of the uh, today's issues in our payments. And uh, uh, I hope most of you guys are awake. And if you have a dog, make sure your food is not close enough because they'll get to it, I promise you. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. And Amy, you tell me where we go from now. I appreciate yeah. the invitation. Thank okay, you. Thanks so much, Sergi. If you have any questions for those on the call, feel free to uh, write them into the Q&A portion in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. And we'll just take those as we have them uh, over the course of the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, Sergi, we have a question first that asks, what tests are performed to consider chemical compatibility? That's a very good question. It is not that easy uh, to do the chemical compatibility uh, right away because there are many factors that come into play. But there are some testing that people do for adhesion to see if it's uh, working or not. Is it more effective or not? And uh, uh, if you are that interested, if you send me an email, any, if you give them uh, my email, I'll be glad to respond, send you some uh, either papers or reports. Or, so there are some ways to do it, but none of these tests are that, uh, none of these uh, characteristics are that easy to identify, unfortunately. So. Okay. Um. We have another one that is asking, um, this is a question from um, out west, it's uh, in Utah. It says, we have a long track record with Lyme in our state. How sure can we be that we'll get comparable long-term performance out of mixes made with liquid anti-strip? That's a very, very good question because the long-term effects uh, was my, my concern too when I started this in uh, early 80s. And uh, uh, to answer your question, I, I can speak from my end as a researcher. Uh, you will get it. You just have to trust based on years of research. But uh, my question always was to people, how do you know you are getting it from one? It's just based on history, right? I mean, nobody did research for 30 years and said, okay, something is working. Let's use it. So, uh, so we need to look at uh, the body of knowledge out there. And many researchers have done wonderful work. And, uh, don't read my papers. They are very boring, put you to sleep. But there are many great researchers all over the country that they have done wonderful work. And if you read them, in many, many cases, uh, uh, liquid anti-strip additives are as effective. Is it every single uh, case? No. But that's true with many uh, 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 products with Lyme also. So there is not, not a magic. This, to me, is a tool in your toolbox. Uh, and, and the long-term effects, by the way, I did a research years and years ago. We made some samples, and this was uh, before many of your times. Uh, we used Marshall samples. We didn't have gyrator samples right now. And I, I made some samples with anti-strip additives, uh, I, I think three or four, I forgot, four different liquid anti-strip additives and lime. And we put them uh, underwater for, uh, I don't remember all the details, I apologize, but for uh, 24 hours, for seven days, uh, yeah, uh, one month, uh, three months, and a year. So we made, I forgot, 800 samples or so. 
uh, remember when you got graduates, you know, so you can make them work, so you don't worry about you know anything. And uh, we tested them after a year. In most cases, the liquid now is that a long term? I cannot tell you, but it's as underwater now. So we had some dry ones, some wet ones. In most cases, liquid anti-strip additives prove to be as effective, if not in some cases, more effective uh, than lime. And uh, based on my knowledge, many, many states have been using liquid anti-strip additives uh, uh, with great success in many, many cases. Fantastic. Uh, our next question is, how is the lime added to the mixture? Is the lime slurry used to treat the aggregates? Oh, I'm sorry. I should. Yeah, in, 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 I can speak at least in South Carolina. Uh, we use it in a slurry format, and, and in my view, in my view, not South Carolina DOTs or anybody else's, in my view, if it's not in slurry format, in many cases you are wasting your time. Uh, it has to be in slurry format to uh, create that bond uh, between your aggregate and asphalt and the chemical reaction. Uh, so in a slurry format, yes. Okay. Our next question is, have there been any studies done on the effects of REOB on liquid anti-strips? Uh, I wanted to say yes, but it's not coming to me. I'd be glad to check my files, and if uh, you find that too, uh, I'd be glad to provide it to you, Amy, then you can, yeah. Uh, okay, give it fantastic. To, I'll make sure I, I follow that yeah. up. Yeah, please, please. Okay, yeah. the next question is, a test is needed to determine if liquid anti-strips are effective to decide if a product gets on an approved products list. Do you recommend any test or process for this purpose? And my recommendation would be, and that's what I've done at least in South Carolina and a couple other states that I have some say, uh, is to look at what you do for right now when you are using a hydrated lime. Now, I know there are completely uh, complete differences between uh, hydrated lime and liquid anti additives and their performance uh, performances in the field, but from testing standpoint, uh, I usually recommend whatever you use for hydrated lime, use the same thing for liquid and see how it's affecting. However, I have a problem with many DOTs, uh, including South Carolina DOT, which I have a lot of respect uh, for people working there. Uh, we use only one rate uh, percentage for our liquid anti-strip additives. I think that should be open to manufacturers' recommendations or contractors, and we go performance base. Whatever uh, DOT says, I'll follow as long as I get to there. Either I use 0.3% liquid or 0.5, I think that should be open to contractors and the manufacturers' recommendation, uh, recommended dosage rate. Uh, but that's Fantastic. where I, I yeah. Um, okay, another question. This is uh, from someone in Saskatchewan asking, mm -hmm. besides chemical compatibility, how effective are liquid anti-strip additives on aggregate sources that might be prone to clay and other surface coatings? Uh, well, that's a, that's a very, very good question because what we are doing here, we are changing the surface of the asphalt when we are adding the liquid anti-strip additive. Uh, lime, obviously, it's a little bit different because we are dealing with the aggregate itself. Uh, so when I'm changing the, aggre uh, the surface of the asphalt, uh, the aggregate has to behave now. If the aggregate is not clean, and if I have some issues with the aggregate, either it's dirty or clay, so forth, uh, that is not going to be as effective. But, but that is somewhat true with even lime. Uh, lime is not going to be as effective in many cases either if I have an extremely dirty aggregate because at the end of the day, the asphalt, which is my glue, uh, has to be really has a nice surface, clean surface to attach to. If I don't have that, as I always say, with any super glue package, it says the surface has to be dry and clean. Uh, even super glue attaches to anything. Uh, but it still recommends the surface to be dry and clean. Same concept with the 
with the aggregate. So. Okay, it looks like we have a couple more questions uh, right now. These two are still from out west. One is asking, uh, or just stating, we have had some issues ensuring our contractors add the appropriate amount of lime to the mix during production. Is the process of adding a liquid anti strip harder to monitor or easier? I knew somebody would ask me that question because that's a that's a very valid and uh, interesting question. I need to be careful how to answer it so politically correct here. And that that that. That's an issue throughout the industry. Let's call it what it is. We cannot hide it. And uh, my view is, I'll tell you how I feel, and then we'll go over maybe. My view is uh, make it performance based. If, if uh, you come up with an ITS value, you come up with a TSR, you do some resilient modulus requirements, whatever it might be. And if they get to that number, minimum number, and I hate to say this, who cares how they came up with it? And if they don't, there's a penalty for it. Uh, now, uh, is it easier? Uh, to some extent, it's easier because there's a small tank. Uh, uh, if, if you know it's calibrated, uh, you can read the input output. But let's face it, they can do anything they want to if uh, there's a desire to cut corners. Uh, so, but uh, but uh, to really scientifically answer that question, just make it performance-based specs as long as they get to it. Uh, uh, what should we worry about? How they got there? Either they use one percent lime or one point two percent, because in some cases we found out we have to increase the lime content in this state. Now, state says only one percent. And everybody uses 1%, but in some cases, 1.2 is better than 1, and in some cases, 0.8 is better than 1. But they can use 0.8. They don't use 1.2 because it's more expensive. They don't do 1.8 because uh, if they get cut, uh, they are in trouble, even though the mixture is doing very well. Uh, so, so it becomes an issue within each state. How do you handle these things. Do you want to make your life easier as a state agency, or do you want to make contractors' life easier and let them do whatever they want to do? So it's a, uh, I know it's a chicken and egg issue and balancing act there. So it's not easy to answer that question. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other hands up at this time. So if you have any other questions, feel free to send those to us now. <laughs> Sergi, this is awesome. So Chad, Chad Hawkins oh. wants to know, what's your dog's name? Uh, Chad, my dog's name, uh, one of them is Bo, the guy with long ears, but not listen. So don't believe anybody has two ears that listen to you when you talk, because this guy has the longest ears, and he doesn't listen to me. And the other guy's name, uh, who is on the couch, my couch that I paid for, and I said I'll never see a dog on it, uh, his name is Tater, Tater Todd. So. <laughs> All right, awesome. So we have one more question, not, not related to your dog. Uh, this is again from Saskatchewan, um, saying the addition of anti-strip agents usually affects the stiffness of asphalt mixtures. Is there one particular anti-strip additive that affects the stiffness of mixtures in a way that is beneficial for compaction properties? Well, there are some, uh, that's an interesting question. There are some admixtures uh, that have some properties such as uh, warm mix uh, additives type thing that that can affect the, uh, the, uh, the effects of uh, uh, the performance in the field when it comes to compaction. Uh, so the answer is uh, yes. I don't want to mention names because, you know, then it becomes an advertisement, but I'll be glad to if you send me an email, <laughs> uh, personal email, I'll be glad to tell you how I feel, but I don't want to mention name of admixtures. But yes, there are some that uh, affect as an anti-strip additive at the same time as uh, a warm mix quality, uh, qualities of warm mix that will affect the compaction in the field. Awesome. Okay, so before we end, I just want to thank Sergi and thank everyone on the call today. And just as a reminder, again, for those of you who have joined us, we will be following up 
with a link to the recording of today's webinar, um, so you'll have access to the information again, these slides, and also we'll be providing professional development certificates for each of you. So thank you again so much for your time. Uh, have a super afternoon, and we look forward to hosting you on another call in the future. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye-bye.